Hi folks, Lee Pacquia here and you're watching The Business of Law where we talk about the challenges and the opportunities facing today's legal profession. My guest today is Mark Cohen. He's the founder and CEO of Legal Mosaic. He's a contributor to Bloomberg BNA and now Fault Lines because Mark, thank you, you gave us an article this week. Uh, good to see you before we jump into things. Good to see you, Lee, and delighted to give you an article. Yeah, it was really cool. It was about Mossack Fonseca, um, the Panam Panamanian uh, law firm that uh, suffered a pretty catastrophic data breach uh, a couple of weeks ago that is getting all kinds of world leaders and celebrities and billionaires in trouble um, for potential malfeasance related to offshoring um, uh, assets. This article was interesting, though, in that it took an angle that I haven't really seen elsewhere in, in media. It talked about the implications um, of this breach from an insurer's perspective. I thought that, that was pretty interesting because Mossack Fonseca is going to be dealing with the financial and legal fallout from this, this breach for, for quite some time. Before we get into it, however, I do want to point out that you have extensive connections in Panama. You did some work down there. Uh, you know a lot of people down there. In your conversations with people in the country, what are they saying about this breach? Any sense as to what happened? Well, uh, with the caveat, Lee, that this is uh, speculation, but I've heard it from uh, three or four what I would call fairly well-informed, highly placed, and reliable sources. Um, they're telling me that it, this was perhaps not so much a hack as it was a disgruntled mistress of a partner at the law firm uh, whose affair with him ended badly, and this is her retribution which of course, you know, is not necessarily, uh, this was a cyber retribution, but it's, you know, just sort of good old fashioned, um, you know, disgruntled payback, uh, which right, could right. happen anywhere, anytime to any organization. Yeah, I was thinking before, you know, it's awfully hard to guard against a paralegal or disgruntled junior associate from walking out the door at the end of the day with a big old hard drive of the firm's material, but this is even harder to guard against. This is, uh, you know, a former mistress of, of a partner. Um, yeah. Tough world uh, that, that it, we're in, uh, where you, know, you have to worry about stuff like this having such a monumental impact well, I, on I, your I organization's day-to-day -day operations. Yeah, I, I guess, Lee, um, you know, sort of going old school for a minute, it does suggest that, um, you know, even in one's private life as a lawyer, one should strive to um, keep the office separate. Um, and maybe a, a, a word of advice to lawyers, don't bring your co uh, computer into your bedroom. Uh, yeah, another argument for a, a, a sustainable and healthy work-life balance. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, unpack this for us. What is the insurer's perspective uh, in looking at a story like the Mossack Fonseca breach? Sure. Um, well, let's uh, start by uh, uh, talking a little bit about uh, insurance because um, uh, I do not know as we speak whether or not um, the law firm in question uh, has a standalone cybersecurity policy. Um, that would be a threshold question uh, to know in terms of answering your question. Um, one of the uh, issues, Lee, is, um, and by the way, um, uh, a lot of AmLaw 100 firms, I, I can't cite you a specific number, but friends in the industry tell me that about only half of the AmLaw 100 firms have standalone cyber policies, uh, really? which I find very surprising. And I obviously you do too, by the way, you said really. Yes. So if, so if say one of those one out of two firms in the AmLaw 100, you know, they suffer a catastrophic breach. They're not insured for the fallout? Well, they are and they're not. Um, all of these firms obviously have um, professional liability coverage, which to some extent would respond to certain types of uh, cyber breaches or breaches of a more, you know, sort of uh, garden variety uh, version if in fact this were to have uh, been um, a disgruntled employee or, you know, a, a someone who was involved with an employee. Um, and likewise, um, most large firms have uh, what uh, are called uh, umbrella policies, which um, would also likely re respond to certain aspects of this kind of a situation. Um, however, um, and some firms also have uh, what are called riders, which are sort of um, contractual add-ons that would cover certain types of uh, exposure emanating from a cyber breach. 
But what they do not cover and what only cyber uh, policies cover uh, are things like um, reputational harm to the firm, which in this case is probably going to be catastrophic. Um, mm -hmm. Hiring investigators to quickly unravel what happened and why. Uh, to repair uh, breached uh, technology platforms, uh, which would allow the firm to uh, resume operations. Um, and uh, also to hire various kinds of uh, PR experts and forensic experts. Um, those are the kinds of additional safeguards uh, and coverages uh, that cybersecurity would provide a law firm with. So this was somewhat of an internal leak of data. I guess you could also classify it as an external leak of data. From an insurer's perspective, does it matter whether it's internal or external to the firm? I don't think that that's really the pivotal issue. I think that really what the insurer would be more concerned about was, was it fraudulent? Because in, in insurance, of course, uh, for public policy reasons, fraud is generally an exception to most all kinds of coverage. And surely if it were to rise to the level of a criminal kind of uh, undertaking by the firm, that is that the firm criminally in uh, uh, colluded with uh, uh, clients, um, you know, to uh, commit uh, uh, unlawful activities. Uh, that would also be, um, you know, something that would be uh, excluded from coverage or most coverages. Um, but I think, Lee, really, apart from insurance issues, there's also the simple issue of whether or not the firm is liable. Um, for you know any kind of negligence, um, whether the firm is liable for any kind of ethical breach, these are also issues I think that all law firms would have to concern themselves with. I didn't think of that. I mean, if this is a former mistress of a of a of a partner, you know, someone who's in a management managerial role at the firm. Um, does that rise to the level of, I mean, is that something that they have to worry about? Well, you know, I think in a situation like this, where you've got world leaders involved and you've got all sorts of third parties who would probably want to, um, sooner or later, file some sort of a claim, there are issues as to whether or not a third party claim as opposed to a direct action by a client of the firm uh, for malpractice or some form of negligent malfeasance. Um, you know, there's some question as to whether or not a third party claim could be maintained. Um, that would depend in large part on the law of the particular jurisdiction that's implicated. And in this case, you've got, you know, potential plaintiffs all over the world who would have potential claims. So there are going to be, you know, a, um, it's going to be certainly a, a, a field day for uh, law firms, both on the plaintiff side and the defense side who are going to be either prosecuting or defending these kinds of legion of claims that are doubtless going to arise as a result of this breach of whatever description or cause it was. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch that process uh, play out in coming weeks, months, and years. <laughs> and I will. It's going to go on for a while. I will tell you, Lee, if you'll remember, uh, um, uh, about 20 or so, 25 years ago, maybe more now, um, the Bhopal accident, um, in, mm -hmm. involving Union Carbide. Well, I was mm -hmm. involved with a, a suit, and this is public record, I was defending AT&T um, in a, a case that really turned on the question of whether Venezuela law would be applied um, or whether uh, U.S. law would be applied. If Venezuela law was applied, um, the uh, reserve for the case was somewhere in the area of a uh, billion dollars. If, on the other hand, it was determined that U.S. law was going to apply and the cases were going to be tried in the United States, the reserve was $7 billion. So these are very, very significant issues. Um, and I assure you that they will all be coming up in the context of this breach. For those actuaries out there who are trying to assess um, level of risk for multinational law firms when it comes to cybersecurity, what are some of the things that they need to be looking at um, in light of what we just learned in the Mossack Fonseca episode? Sure. Um, well, for one thing, Lee, um, remember that Mossack Fonseca was a you know sort of a quiet niche firm operating in Panama, and anyone who's been to Panama uh, would first be had not been there before would be amazed by the skyline. Um, I leave it you know to you and others uh, to to wonder how it is that um, Panama would have the kind of uh, Manhattan-like skyline that it has. 
um, you know, a lot of people would say that, you know, it's because a lot of money is parked there, uh, much the way the Miami skyline, and this is a secret that everybody knows, uh, the Miami skyline was created in the 80s and 90s uh, by laundered drug money. So um, I think to get back to your question, uh, I think that insurers would want to know, first of all, you know, in a Panamanian law firm like this that is involved in this kind of thing, you know, is everything that they're doing above board? Um, they would also want to know, uh, in the case of uh, this firm, um, they don't forget they had 34 satellite offices in different countries around the world. Not a small organization. Not a small organization, but query, um, you know, what kind of safeguards did they have? Um, what kind of integ integration was there between um, the offices in terms of um, technology? Um, what sort of uh, good um, cyber hygiene did the firm uh, conduct? So I think the first thing that the firm, uh, the, the, the insurer would do is in its application, which is generally pretty rigorous, particularly for cyber standalone coverage, but even now for legal malpractice coverage, they're going to ask a lot of questions, which frankly are good things for law firms to answer. Because whether they get the standalone coverage or they don't, um, whether they have a cyber policy or they don't, um, then um, firms certainly, I think for their own liability purposes, should be looking to take these kinds of safeguards that the kinds of uh, actuarial questions that are posed in the applications would ask. Mark, just in turning back to what this means for Mossack Fonseca uh, going forward, um, is this breach necessarily fatal to the firm's going concern interests? I would say, Lee, it's a little early to tell, but in this particular case, um, given the fact that we're talking about 11.5 million documents, uh, which is the largest breach ever of its kind to date, um, given you know the high profile of many of the clients, given the nature of the allegations, um, I think it's going to be very difficult for this firm to uh, recover. But I would assure you that if for some reason this firm were to go under, uh, I would imagine that many more will uh, step up to take its place and to do very similar kinds of activities in a short order. Yeah, no shortage of that work. I wouldn't imagine so. Mark, always a pleasure. Thanks for taking the time today. Great to be with you, Lee. That's Mark Cohen from Legal Mosaic. If you'd like to see more of the stuff we're working on, be sure to go check us out online. You can find us at mimesislaw.com under the Business of Law tab. If you're watching us on YouTube, do us a favor and subscribe to the channel. More good stuff coming. If you're listening to us as a podcast, do us a favor and write us a good review in the comments. It makes all the difference in the world. Thanks for watching. I'm Lee Pacquia. See you next time. Uh, about a week ago, they're going to extend the partnership to Australia. Let's start with the basics here. What happened in this deal? Well, you've got uh, two parts to it. Uh, the first part is that DLA, which as you know, is one of the largest law firms in the world, um, approached 